the population in 2050. When I was a student in demography some 25 years ago, the overwhelming question was, how can we stop the world population reaching 24 billion by the end of this century? Now, we think we will hit about 10 billion in 2050 and then flatten. Why has this happened? It's this, falling fertility. At the same time, we did not realize that across the globe, women would choose to have less children. So much so that two-thirds of the world's countries now are approaching or below replacement level of about 2.1 children per woman of childbearing age. And that means that there are countries throughout Asia, Thailand, Vietnam, that have got lower childbearing rates than here in Europe. And it means that urban India and Singapore and Korea, we have women who are choosing to have one child only. Now, people often ask, what is the reason for this? And it's complicated, but probably something to do with the introduction of family planning programs and, crucially, education. If we can educate young girls, we can empower them. We can give them the skills to go out into the workplace. But most importantly, we can change their ideas and help them to understand that women can have other roles other than endless childbearing. But so far, I've just talked about women and women's choice. And before I go on, I just want to share some interesting research that's just come out of the University of Copenhagen. And this is about falling male fertility. Now, I don't know whether you know this, but apparently optimal male fertility is 100 million sperm per milliliter which I find a little terrifying, actually. <laughs> when we move across to 40 million, you hit subfertility, and when you hit 10 million, you have infertility. And this is the result from the Danish army. If you look at the orange, which are subfertility, and the red, which are infertility, the study shows that half the Danish army currently are sub- or infertile. And if we compare that with a similar study that was done in 1945 on U.S. Army, you can see by looking at the green bar, 70% of U.S. recruits had optimal fertility, compared with the red lines, which is the current Danish Army. Why this is happening, we're not really quite clear. Probably something to do with the environment. But if it's happening in a place like Scandinavia, I think it's very clear that we need more research to understand the dynamics of male infertility in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. But regardless of the causes, it is changing our fundamental population structure. We grew up with the idea that we had a population pyramid, lots of young people being born and entering our societies and economies. And we know that this across this century is going to change. And I've mapped this out for you uh, in this way. What we've done is we have taken the percentage of children per country. Concentrate on the yellow, their countries who in 1980 had over a quarter of their population children, whereas the red are those countries where it has fallen to less than 15%. And I'm just going to run this forward. And you can see the blue is the transition. You can see that slowly the yellow is beginning to fade away and the red is increasing. So that by the middle of the century, only really in Africa will we still have a large percentage of the population children. And if we run up to 21,000, we see that, in fact, the vast majority of countries will have less than 15% of their population children. And this means that countries which today, like Afghanistan and Pakistan, have roughly over 40% of their population under 15, they too will drop their fertility quite dramatically. That's a good thing, because as I said at the beginning, it's falling fertility that is bringing down maximum world population. If I say that we never envisaged 25 years ago that we would max out at 8 billion, we also never envisaged the increase in material consumption. And I think how we've got to start looking at the population environment debate is to move away from population size and turn onto this, the consumption of different parts of the world. Because not only are we increasing our material consumption, we are also finding a huge differentials in the ability of different populations to consume. Let's just take food. In Africa, 
we have people who so under-consume calories that their health is being impaired, and they cannot fight off infection or acute diseases. And at the other side, in the developed world, we have people who are so over-consuming that they themselves are damaging their health. Obesity, diabetes, and they're becoming very vulnerable to chronic disease. I think it is very improbable that by 2050, we will not have countries in the least developed world massively increasing their consumption in order to raise their quality of life and standard of living. And there is an argument that in order for them to do this in a finite planet, we in the West have got to reduce our material consumption. So the question is, will we be able to do that? And the answer is, I don't know. But what I do know is that the majority of the people in this room will still be here, probably in 2050, to find out. Because the trend I've been talking about has been falling fertility, and the other really big trend of the 21st century is increasing longevity. Here we have the latest UK figures on the growth of centenarians. And if you look, uh, at the bottom of the map, then basically we can say there's about 12,000 people, age 100, in the UK at the moment. And the UK government is predicting that by the middle of the century, we will be approaching half a million centenarians, and by the end of the century, we will be approaching a million. Now, if we extrapolate those figures to Europe, we can say that currently, there are 127 million Europeans who are going to reach at least 100. And that means that Europe will have 3 million centenarians by the middle of the century, and it will have approaching 6 million centenarians by the end. And the two really big issues, I think, that we're going to have to consider is, is this added life expectancy going to be healthy or disabled? We're pushing back life, but are we pushing it back so that people are healthy, or will those last couple of decades be frail and disabled? That's a huge unknown question at the moment. And the other really big question is, as we push towards 100, are we also increasing the number of supercentenarians, those people who are over 110, 115? Or is there going to be a maximum life, maybe around about 120, where the human body, due to senescence or aging, simply, despite science and technology, cannot live any longer? Another, actually, unknown question. But whatever happens, we are already changing the way we live as individuals and changing our society. This is a wonderful statue at Blackfriars Station. I hate to say it's probably one of the only reasons you might want to go to Blackfriars Station, but it really is worth going uh, to see it. It's called The Seven Ages of Man, and you can see from the baby up to the old man. And the really key question is, as we're living longer, are we going to have 8, 10, 12 stages? Or are we going to stretch out the stages of our lives? I recently gave a talk to school children, and a little boy said to me, if I'm going to live till I'm 150, I'm not going to start having kids till I'm 80. <laughs> but that actually was spot on. It's what we see happening in Europe at the moment. People are delaying life transitions. We're delaying leaving home, getting married, having children, becoming grandparents, etc. Already, we are looking at our life courses in the light of the knowledge that we are living far longer than our grandparents and our parents. The other big question is going to be this. Generational succession. We have societies where we pass down assets and power and money down through the generations. What happens when you don't inherit from your parents till you're 80? Or from your grandparents until you're 80? But that is the world that we are entering. What will this do to our world of work, communities, politics, when we have these long, hopefully, active, healthy lives? So, to summarize, the population in 2050 is actually going to be smaller than we thought it was going to be, and it is going to be older than we thought it is going to be. And let us hope that the benefits that we here in Europe and other parts of the developed world have been able to take on board from our falling fertility and our increasing longevity, particularly healthy uh, longevity, 
that these can be spread to the least developed countries and the less developed countries. But in order to do that, inevitably, we're going to have to increase the forms of consumption, particularly education and healthcare in these parts of the world. And that is going to have an impact on our environment. So I think the really big question about population 2050 is going to be this interaction between our changing population and the environmental constraints that this population will face going forward. Thank you.